So if you're not already standing, would you stand with me and open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy? If you don't have a Bible this morning, <clears throat> you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will gladly bring you one. If you don't own a Bible, you can obviously keep that as our gift to you. We are in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, so open to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 is where we're going to pick it up. As we're going through the scriptures today, if you have a question on the message or a question on the Christian faith or any sort of theology question, you can text your questions to the phone number that is up on the screen, and we will talk about those on the questions podcast this week. Deuteronomy chapter 1, we'll begin reading this morning at verse 9. There we read, And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times more numerous than you are and bless you, as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said at that time, the thing that you have told us to do is good. And so I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you. Leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Father, I do pray that you would speak to us. You'd speak through me, even through the system that we're using, a little bit different than we normally would do things, but we trust that you are able to speak through your word anytime, any way, any place. And so we pray that you would continue to speak to us and use your word by the working of your spirit to transform us by the renewing of our minds. And Lord, this text that is 3,400 years old, I pray that you would make it alive to us today, make it applicable to us in our time, that we would be able to see how this is relevant to the things that we are experiencing as a nation, as a people. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all those that agreed said, Amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, a group of three academics, they ventured together in a series of research experiments to prove a theory that they had. Now, before I go on to explain the theory and the research that these three academics engaged in, it might be helpful to explain that as most of you probably recognize, every area of industry, whether it is construction or it is information technologies or hospitality or electronics, music, fashion, whatever area of industry, including academia, there are certain outputs that are expected from those areas of industry, outputs that must be produced if these industries are going to function, and not only if they are going to function, but if the the businesses and the individuals that are in those industries, if they're going to survive and they're going to thrive. For some of you this morning, your output might be computer code. For some of you, your output might be architectural designs, or maybe your output is good outcomes for your clients or for your patients. If you don't produce those outputs, if you don't produce those things, then you don't get paid, or you don't get promoted, or you go out of business. And the same is true in the academic world. In the world of scholars and academia, the output that you must produce is peer-reviewed and published research in journals that are associated with the fields that you are studying in. And so if you're a scholar, If you're a PhD at a research university, you're working at an academic institution, part of your job is teaching the classes that you teach, but really your teaching is not your main focus. Your greater focus in that context and in that situation, the output that you are looking to produce is further study, further research in your given field of study, and then you're hoping that that study and that research is gonna advance your field of study, And the way that that happens is that your research and your study is put into, it's published in journals associated with your given field of study and peer-reviewed, and that, that earns you or that brings in a lot of times more grant money which makes it possible for you to continue your research. So, so that's really the target that you're going after is that you want your research to be published 
and peer-reviewed and to be in some of these most respected and prestigious journals. Well, back to these three academics who ventured on this research a few years ago. They had a growing concern as they looked at their own fields of study. A couple of them were uh, working in universities. One of them had been a university professor, but he had stepped away from that. But they, they had this theory, really, that some of the fields of academia in which they work or that they were seeing in their university campuses, especially in the area of the social sciences, that some of those areas of study had been tainted by ideological corruption. And so they were very concerned about this. So the three of them came up with this research project, and the research project was pretty simple. They were going to set out to try to produce research papers, study papers, and they were going to submit them to a whole bunch of the most prominent research journals in the social sciences and to see if they could get these, these um, papers, these research papers, published even though the research papers were written under pseudonyms, they were written under false names, and they were written with fake and absurd research, and um, they were hoping that by getting them published, they could prove that there was a problem within the social sciences, and maybe that they would be able to expose the corruption that had come into the social sciences. And so they made these papers, and they submitted them to various social science journals having to do with gender studies, having to do with race studies and sexuality studies, all these similar topics. Now, for a lot of academics, you can work for years in an area of study and work on research and then submit it and never ever get it published. But for these three academics, over the case, or course of a few months, not years, but a few months, they were able to get seven of their fake papers submitted and accepted to be published in these very prominent journals. Well, two questions kind of come to mind. First, what were these fake papers about? Well, let me give you an example of what a few of them were about. One of them, which was a rewrite of a chapter from Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, was submitted on the topic of intersectional feminism to the Journal of Women and Social Work and got accepted for publication and for peer review. Another one was on the topic of canine rape culture in dog parks. And this was approved for publication in one of the number one feminist gender studies journals called Gender. A third of the seven articles that got accepted to be published was to be published in the journal Fat Studies, and it presented the concept that accumulating cellulite, that is, getting fatter, should be considered a form of competitive bodybuilding. Now, if this sounds absurd to you, that, that was entirely the point. That was the whole point of doing this, was to submit these fallacious, absurd things and to see if they would get published for peer review, and they did. I'm not making this up. You can actually find out about this if you go online and, and read about it. So those were some of the articles. Second question that comes to mind is, why does any of this matter? What, what's the point of this? I've, I'm sure coming to church on a Sunday morning, you wouldn't imagine that this would be something that we would be talking about, but it matters because respected journals like these in the social sciences and research like what is submitted to these journals is what ultimately directs public policy. This is a lot of times what is used to make the bills that find their way through Congress and on the president's desk. So they are used for public policy. Not only are they used for public policy, but they're used for public funding. And they're used for educational and educational curriculum that is not just used at universities, but in primary schools, elementary schools, and secondary schools, high schools. And so a lot of this stuff, it, it starts as research, is submitted for peer review and publication, and then it ends up directing things in our society, and not just in schools, and not just in public policy, but many of you in the work that you're in, if you work for a corporation, they have a human relations department, and that HR department, a lot of times their policy is directed by this sort of stuff as well. So when you hear that second and third graders are being taught issues of gender theory and sexuality, it is precisely because of peer-reviewed research and social science journals, respected social science journals like these. It, it is this kind of research that directs and affects our society. It's this kind of scientific study that is put forth in our culture that is at this very moment causing a growing number of people, especially those who are younger people, to believe that the most dangerous people, the most dangerous people in our culture today 
are white Christian heterosexual men. That is what's coming out of a lot of this stuff that is ideologically corrupt if, if you would look into it. So, so that's why this matters. Now, the bigger question this morning is, what on earth does this have to do with Deuteronomy chapter 1? And, and I totally understand if you're thinking that I, I can't see how these connect. So I'm hoping that I, in the time that we have remaining today, we'll be able to show you how these things come together. The passage that is before us that we just read from a few minutes ago, Deuteronomy chapter 1, it has some very important things to say and to teach us about the governing of society. In other words, this 3,400-year-old document is a, a sociological document. More than 2,000 years before the study of sociology even comes on the scene, this is giving us some information about how a society will function and how it is to work. And, and so when we come to the scriptures here at Cross Connection Church, in addition to hoping that through the Bible we connect with God and we connect with Christ Jesus, when we come to the scriptures, we also are hoping to discover what God's word would teach us about, about him and about how we ought to live. That's the study of ethics. When we talk about how we ought to live, we're hoping that this book will teach us how we ought to live as his people in the world. And this text here before us today, I think it has some things to teach us as it relates to those things. A, a passage like this one is relevant and applicable. Now that's an important thing to say because there are people in our day who are asking the question, how is this stuff that was written all these years ago, how is it relevant and applicable? But this is relevant and applicable to us because it presents us with a worldview. It helps us to see the world in which we live, how we are to view society. And this is a worldview and a perspective that our culture right now is in collision with. It's colliding with this perspective. Sociological theory that if you go and study it, both in the, the research paper, papers, the journals, if you take a class on sociology today in a modern university, sociological theory in this postmodern, post-Christian, Western, 21st century society that we live in, it sees our inherited social structure. So the way that we live, the way, the norms, the culture that we govern ourselves by, it sees this inherited social structure as oppressive and regressive. And it sees it as in need of deconstruction and radical reformation. If you listen to some of the things that is coming out through the rhetoric and politics, or you listen to some of the things on cable news, you will hear all these kind of things spoken of as you listen to this very critically that that people see this world as something that needs to be radically reformed if if you don't believe me all you have to do is to pick up some of these social science journals or listen to cable news or listen to the political rhetoric the modern worldview sees hierarchical structures so people at the top leading people down the line it sees this hierarchical structure as socially constructed, something that has been created over time by us, and it is created to favor people who are in positions of power. And we are told that those people who are the power players, that they are in the positions that they are in because of immorality, they're in the positions that they're in because of their own personal wickedness, malevolence, and they are constantly trying to work to maintain their power at the cost of every single other person that is down the line. That's the, the formulation that we are given. Now, that formulation, if accurate, if that is true, sounds acceptable. And, and so in that situation, you are Katniss Everdeen. And the President Snow in the Capitol, and there with this whole thing that we're in, this is Pan Am, and, and we are fighting against those people in the Capitol and President Snow, and they're holding this grip, and they're holding us down, and they have us in this death struggle for their own entertainment and to keep them in positions of power, and that's, that's the world that we, we live in. And, and we, we see it in our entertainment, we see it in our news stories, we see it in our politics. Whether you're on the right or you're on the left, we, we see it. And so you'll hear things like, there are three men in our country Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, three men in our country hold more wealth than the bottom 50% of people 
in our country. And, and you'll hear people say, that's not fair. And maybe you sitting here this morning, you say, well, I, I kind of feel that there's an inequity there too. It seems like there's an unequal distribution. And most people stack up at the bottom of that unequal distribution of this hierarchy. And, and those people, those white men really, further up the hierarchy, they've done something malevolent. They've done something immoral and wrong to get to the position they are at. You can't possibly get to the position you're at without having stolen your stuff. So either it was them doing something wicked or we live in a wicked, oppressive economic system that has made it possible for there to be this injustice. There's something evil, some sort of invisible hand that has guided it so that those, the haves stay at the top and they're always at the top and they keep us down. Does any of that sound familiar? This is the perspective of a lot of people in our own country and throughout the West. When I say the West, I mean Western Europe, the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States of America. This is the view of a lot of people. And since, they will say, since we in the West live in a society and a culture that is built under a European Judeo-Christian construct, then the people at the top are all white Christian males of European descent, what, what is referred to a lot of times in the social sciences as the patriarchy. And so this is that group, this seemingly invisible, malevolent group that is holding every people person down. That is the patriarchy. And, and how could we possibly forget that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are all equal? And so because of the fact that we're all equal, then there should be some equity. Now, maybe this morning the things that I'm saying, they may sound unfamiliar to you, sound foreign to you. Maybe you haven't heard these sort of things, but I, I guarantee you, I promise you, even though you may not have heard it articulated in this way, you have received it through media, through entertainment, through the news, through politics. You've received it through advertising. And if you don't think you have heard it, if you have kids, like I do, that are in elementary school, or you have kids in middle school or high school, or you have kids that have gone away to university, they have absolutely heard some of these things that are going around in our culture. They're getting it too. Now, where did such a worldview come from? You know, when you ask those kind of questions, immediately you might think of names like Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche. Maybe it came from some of these old economists or philosophers, people like John Stuart Mill and John Dewey and Friedrich Hayek. Maybe it came from John Rawls or Thomas Nagel or Jacques Derrida or Michel Foucault, maybe those are the names that are, that are pushing this. Noam Chomsky, Chomsky in, in a more modern context, where did this actually come from? Well, fascinatingly, if you turn to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, we have gone here quite frequently in the last few months. Genesis chapter 3, the first book of the Bible, third chapter. We read this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Note this, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he ate also. One of the oldest stories in the Bible. This serpent character says to the woman Eve in this passage, he says there, God knows that when you eat of this tree that he's holding you back from, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. He is holding you back from this tree and he's holding you back from something good that you're going to get from this tree. And she saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise. What is that? The idea, it's a seed planted in the mind of Eve by the serpent, this ideology that an unjust, invisible hand is at the top of the hierarchy holding us down. This is not new. Point number one on your outline, 
the genesis of an idea is often as important as the idea itself. It took us a little while to get there. The genesis of an idea is often as important as the idea itself. In the same way as Jesus said in Matthew and Mark, Matthew's Gospel chapter 11, Luke's Gospel chapter 7, in the same way that Jesus said wisdom is justified by her children, I think it is also true that the origin of an idea, where the idea comes from, the presupposition, the worldview, the bias, where that idea comes from will give you a lot of clarity about the idea itself. Both of these, wisdom is justified by her children, so the outcomes of an idea are important, and the genesis of the idea, where it came from, these things are important for clarifying what these things are all about and the wisdom of the idea itself. Now, all of this as an incredibly long introduction to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Here, in this text, in verses 9 through 15 that we read a little bit ago, in this text we are examining the importance of a hierarchy of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Remember in the text, Moses said to the people, choose men who had wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So there's a hierarchy of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom for ordering a society, how a society will function, and governing that society, how it is going to work. And if you remember, if you were here last week, we were looking at this very same text, excuse me for a moment, and we went from this text back to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 18, because in Exodus chapter 18 is the historic context that Moses here in Deuteronomy 1 is revisiting. He's taking the children of Israel back in time to the very beginning of their journey on their way to the promised land that has now taken 40 years. So he wants them to revisit this situation that happened in Exodus chapter 18 where this whole thing happened, where they set up this hierarchy for governing society. Why is Moses taking them back to history? He is revisiting Israel's history in order to prepare this generation that is about to go into the promised land and they're going to go into the promised land without Moses. And Moses has been the one that's been helping lead them, even though he'd led them through this hierarchical structure of leaders. They're going to go into the promised land. He's going to die. He's not going to go with them. And so as they go into the promised land, they need to be able to govern themselves. They need to be able to lead themselves, to walk in God's will and in God's word. They are preparing to take hold of God's blessing, the promised land. And as they go into the promised land, they have to govern themselves according to the principles and the precepts of the law, the covenant. They are in a relationship with God, a covenant, and the stipulations of that relationship is the law, and they have to govern themselves. So how will they govern themselves? How will this society function when it goes into the land? Is it every man for himself? Is it a, a flat a flat organizational structure and everybody just gets to do their own thing. We will see how that goes later on when we get to books like Judges far in the future. But how are they going to govern themselves? Well, look at the text. Deuteronomy 1.13, we read, Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes. And Moses said 40 years ago, and I will make them heads over you. When you study very carefully, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what we refer to as the Torah, or sometimes we call it the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, the five books of the law, when you study these things, you find that God's expectation for the society of his people, living under his covenant, his expectation for them was that they were to be a democratic, republican theocracy a democratic republican theocracy. Now, everything in that democratic republican theocracy, everything in that may sound okay to you except for the word theocracy. That tends to scare people a little bit, even, even Christians living in our modern context. When we hear the word theocracy, theocracy, there's an image that is produced in our minds. And I, I wanna suggest to you that the image that is probably produced in your mind is not really the image that God is promoting for his people as they are a democratic republican theocracy. So Israel was a theocracy insofar as the law that they were going to govern themselves by was divinely given. 
It was given to them by God. That's how they were a theocracy. It was a law given them by God. We're going to look at that a lot more when we get into Deuteronomy chapter 5 and we look very specifically at the law that God gives to them. So Israel was a theocracy insofar as the law that they had was a law that God had given to them. But Israel was a democratic republic in that the people were to choose democratically, he says in this passage, choose for yourselves wise, knowledgeable, understanding people. So they were democratic. They were to choose for themselves these people that will represent you and judge you. That's Republican. So a democratic Republican form of government that they were going to have to represent and take care of them as they would come into the land. Now, when we see words like democratic, Republican, we can somewhat relate to that living here in the United States of America in the 21st century because the government that we are accustomed to is, is somewhat similar. It's not identical, but it's somewhat similar. The 16th century reformer, John Calvin, he believed that a society ought to have, and I quote, a well-ordered government by the common consent of all. And so John Calvin, in his commentary on the book of Micah, he says this, and, and he says that that was what God, based on this very passage, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 9 through 18, and Exodus chapter 18, he says these passages show to us that it was God's order for the children of Israel. And, and Calvin said that even for our own societies, that we be governed, we have a well-ordered government by the common consent of all. And effectively, that was the endorsement of Moses as well in this passage. So these things bring us to the, the, the conditions and the qualifications for the leaders. The conditions and qualifications for the leaders. And from this, we're going to draw out some applications. So Observe, first of all, that the people of God were told by Moses that they were to choose from among their tribes wise, understanding, and knowledgeable individuals to serve as chiefs. That word heads could also be translated captains or chiefs. To serve as chiefs. The, the core of my message last week was focusing on the issue of wisdom, and we're going to talk more about that both today and in the coming weeks as well. Wisdom was very important as it related for how they choose these leaders and what kind of leaders they were going to choose as well. So Israel was given the responsibility of walking in accordance with God's covenant. They had to keep God's law because they're in a relationship with God and there are stipulations for that relationship. Just like every single one of you that is married, you are joined together in a covenant with your spouse and there are stipulations for that covenant and you made vows until death do you part and sickness and in health to be faithful to one another, you made vows under stipulations to stay in that relationship together. Same thing with the children of Israel. So there are stipulations that are to govern this relationship with God and Israel and to ensure that they would do so, that they would follow these stipulations. They were responsible for selecting leaders. Leaders and judges that would direct their obedience or their lack of obedience, if they disobeyed, that would call them to task, that would call them back to walking with the Lord, repentance. So, if you will have good leaders who are wise and knowledgeable and understanding, you better choose those leaders wisely. You better choose those leaders in a good way. Why? Well, Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived, he observed in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, that righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. And so sin would be missing the mark of God's perfect standard or it would be disobeying God's stipulations, his law, and that's going to lead to the destruction of society. So choose, Moses says, choose wisely. Choose wisely, wise leaders who will have knowledge and understanding. So, so we have these words, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. They, they sound at face value, like just synonyms. Are they just the same saying of the word, the same statement of the same idea? No, they're not. Knowledge is an acquisition of facts and data. You and I, we, we acquire information constantly. Every time we're looking at the world around us, we're taking in information and we're being bombarded by information through the news and through television and through advertising and through movies and through interaction with people, we are bombarded with information perpetually and virtually 
all of us know some pretty knowledgeable people, people who know a lot of facts and figures. I mean, Google, Google knows a lot of facts and figures. Siri knows a lot of facts and figures. And so we, we have ways that we can get a lot of information and you can be knowledgeable by just knowing a lot of facts and figures. This is the, the issue of what. You're, you're taking in information, what. That's knowledge. Understanding goes a step further than knowledge. Understanding deals with comprehension. It deals with what the data and information means. It's, it's an interpretive step. So we move from what, facts and figures, in knowledge, to issues of why in understanding. Why are these things the way that they are? This is a, an issue of terp- interpretation. So knowledge, understanding. Third, wisdom. Wisdom, point number two on your outline. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. It's knowing what to do with what you know. It's an issue of how to apply the data. Knowledge is what, facts and figures. Understanding is why, interpreting what it all means. And then wisdom is how to apply it. Now, it's kind of a corny way of saying it, but it it illustrates the picture pretty good. Knowledge is being able to observe and recognize and identify an object as a tomato. Understanding is being able to deduce that that tomato, that object, is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad, that it, it doesn't go in the fruit salad very well. Now, before some of you start to send me email recipes of your fruit salad that has tomatoes, I realize there are some strange people who put tomatoes in their fruit salad and um, those are probably the same people who put salt on their watermelon or put cheddar cheese with their apple pie. So you're already a little suspect to us. Um, but but most, for the most part, tomatoes don't go in the fruit salad. That's wisdom knowing those sort of things. So the people of God, both 3,400 years ago and today, have a responsibility as the redeemed people of God to walk out the covenant of God according to his law, his stipulations, And doing so will result in abundance. Doing so will result in fullness of blessing in his land for the children of Israel 2,000 years ago and more. So this is how we enter into this. Therefore, point number three on your outline. To survive and thrive as God's people, we need wise, understanding, and knowledgeable leaders. Moses writes there in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 14, And you answered me and said, The thing that which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable, understanding men, wise and knowledgeable men, and I made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, officers for your tribes. Now, I doubt that there is any of you here today who wouldn't also have responded to Moses when he said these things, the thing that you have told us to do is good. I think we, we all recognize the goodness of what Moses called them to do. Is, is there anyone who would honestly disagree with the premise that wise and understanding and knowledgeable leaders are beneficial for societies? I don't, I don't think that any of us would disagree with this. The obvious question, though, is how do we identify such leaders? That's an important question. How do we identify who the wise, knowledgeable, and understanding people are so that we can appoint them as heads over society? And I think part of the answer to that is found there in verse 15 when we read this. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men. Israel, at the time that Moses called them to do this, they were already subdivided into tribes according to the 12 sons of Jacob. You remember Abraham, the book of Genesis. He was the father of the Jewish people. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot begot Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And those 12 sons, Levi, and, you know, go down the list, Reuben and so forth, Gad, all of those 12 sons, they become the heads of 12 tribes. So when Israel left Egypt under the leadership of Moses, they were already subdivided into these 12 tribes. And at that smaller subdivided tribal level, there were already 
identifiable individuals who were captains, heads, over the people. They were standouts. Why were they standouts? What made these individuals stand out? It wasn't just because they were old. It wasn't just because they had lots of kids or grandchildren and so forth. How did these people stand out? Well, they were known to be leaders at that smaller subdivided community level by the way that they lived their lives. That their lives on a daily basis were observable by those who lived around them in the tents next to them, if you will. They were able to be seen that they lived their life in a way that was wise, exercising knowledge and understanding. Believe it or not, wise leaders are not all that difficult to identify. Point number four on your outline. Wise leaders stand out by applying knowledge to the everyday issues of life. They apply knowledge to the everyday issues of life. What, what, what kind of everyday issues of life? Well, how well do they do their job? How well do they provide for their families? How well do they lead their children? How well do they interact with other people when they're doing business or when they're just talking in the community? Can they be counted on? Can they be trusted to take care of your own stuff, to take care of your kids? You can observe how they live their lives. Do they have self-control? Do they have integrity? You are able at that subdivided community level to be able to see in the lives of people how they are living their lives. And Moses seems to assume here in this passage, that if individuals do well within the smaller community level, then they will do well when they are given greater responsibility at higher levels of leadership within the community. If you read the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he says basically the same thing. When he's talking about the qualifications for leaders within the church, which he calls elders, He says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that we are to apply these same exact principles. We see how does this person govern their home? How do they deal with their kids? How do they deal with their finances? Are they trustworthy? And these are the kind of people by interacting with them we can see. So when a leader stands out as wise, applying knowledge and understanding in the subdivided community levels among families and friends, then they move higher up the hierarchy. They move to greater levels of responsibility and greater levels of authority. This is the way that God intended these things to work in culture and in the world. And as they move up, they they learn to apply knowledge and understanding more in wise ways even more as they go up the hierarchy. And so, so this is very, very important. Now, there are those who argue that Jesus promoted a flat organizational structure. But those people who say that Jesus in the Gospels promoted a flat organizational structure, they are, they are ignorant of the whole counsel of God, Old Testament, New Testament, and I would suggest that they are misreading Jesus. They're not fully comprehending what Jesus has to say. Now, I have a whole lot to say about this topic of hierarchy in society and also within nature, uh, but I'll have to wait for some, some future studies. We'll get to it. But be that as it may, let me close with this and wrap it up. Point number five on your outline. Those who rightly understand and apply knowledge become wise and respected leaders. <clears throat> Those who rightly understand and apply knowledge become wise and respected leaders and they ascend, they climb if you will, what you might call a competence hierarchy. They show that they know how to lead. And because they know how to lead, they receive greater responsibility and greater authority. This is what we would expect would happen in a well-constructed society that works as it should. Now, of course, at this point, you may say objection. But what if a hierarchy breaks down? What if it no longer functions like that? What if it gets to a point where it seems like people are rising to higher levels just because of who they're related to, nepotism? Or they're rising to higher levels just because of the fact that they have money? Or they're stronger than everybody else? Or maybe they're better looking than other people? There are other measures, and it's not wisdom and knowledge and understanding that are causing them to rise to the top, but there are other things. What happens when the hierarchy becomes corrupt and it begins to break down? Well, absolutely there are, are many 
pictures of that in history. History proves that that happens. So what happens when that happens? Well, that society will, it will fall. It will grow corrupt, and as it grows corrupt, it will not be able to stand up under the weight of what is needed, and it will collapse. And when it collapses, there is what we might call a reboot. And sometimes that happens from within. Sometimes that happens from without. We're going to read Israel's history as we go forward in the New Testament. We're going to see sometimes the nation fell apart from within because they didn't have wise understanding and knowledgeable leaders. And sometimes it was punished from the outside. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks coming and bringing destruction because they had walked away from God. And their leaders were not leading them correctly. And so there was a a reboot. There was a revolution. There was a reformation that would come. This is why it is essential that we order our societies correctly. At the granular community level, within the church, within connect groups, within families, in the lower areas of governance and society, in cities, in counties, in states, in national level, on the world level, we need to order our societies the right way. This is why you and I, we need to be looking for opportunities to apply wisdom and knowledge and understanding in smaller areas and then stepping out by faith to fill higher levels of responsibility as God by his enabling power enables us to do so. Our tribe... Cross Connection Church, we're the Cross Connection Church tribe. This is what we we need. We need knowledgeable, understanding, wise individuals. Now, you may not feel like a knowledgeable, understanding, or wise individual, but as you grow in your understanding of the scriptures and you apply the principles of the scripture in your home, with your spouse, with your kids, and your workplace, people will begin to see it. People around you here at this church, they're going to invite you just as These leaders were invited to be in positions of responsibility, given more authority, and you step into those roles and you grow in your wisdom and knowledge and understanding so that you can be a leader in a larger context. Now, if this morning, as I close really quickly, if this morning you look out at our community, our city, our county, our state, our nation, and you say, things are being led perfectly well, everything's good, great. If, however, you look at our nation, our community, and you see areas where things seem to be breaking down and falling apart, then then what are you doing to take responsibility for those things? I want to suggest to you that God is allowing you to see areas where there's a breakdown, even if it's just in the church something that's not being taken care of because he might be calling you to step out by faith to exercise knowledge and understanding in a wise way to be used to help things move forward in a positive direction. And I want to suggest to you that God might be calling you to do that and and I would encourage you to not resist that because God is calling you to step in and be involved in those things. If you see a breakdown... God wants you to be involved. How are you exercising responsibility in a wise and understanding way to see society thrive and survive? It's a challenging question to think about this week. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father God, I thank you for the challenge of your word. I pray that even though this is coming through a screen, it's a little bit different than we normally do things, that you would cause your word, which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, to affect us at a deep level. And that you would continue to transform us and that you'd quicken our ears and our hearts to hear the word of your spirit, calling us to take responsibility for the areas in our lives, whether it's in our home or in our workplace or in the community or in the church, to step out and apply wisdom and knowledge and understanding to see society move in a direction that is for your glory and for the thriving of the culture that we live in. God, I think we need that. I think that my brothers and sisters here this morning probably agree with that. So would you do a work, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, amen.